There we go. Let's pray and we'll talk about this in a minute. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings of another day for the teachings peculiar or particular, I should say, about Romans, especially having to do with um, how one might know they are safe, safe with you, safe because of you, have a life and a future and a hope because of you. Um, uh, teaching about predestination and it's a uh, it, care needs to be taken so that that uh, teaching is not lost nor abused um, to remember that uh, you make it possible for us to live a life that's completely devoted to the well-being of others because you were completely devoted to us so we can live a life that actually pursues this principle uh, doing no harm to another person but on the contrary doing them good so that and the other lessons that are before us in Romans today, uh, bless to our, uh, our lives and through our lives to those of others, bless the students, loved ones, uh, their friends and family, each according to their needs until we uh, come together again on Monday for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, so this movie Focus, it's kind of, I mean, you may not be in favor of it because it's Will Smith is a, a con man and he's very good at it, like exceedingly good at it. Um, and, and so it kind of climaxes in this big um, uh, con he put together for this gambling guy. And so he bet him like this mountain of money that the, the gambling guy could pick any number of any player on the field and Will Smith would guess it. And then he did. And so his girlfriend, of course, was really angry at him because she thought he was just being totally reckless with gambling away everybody's money that was part of this con, con scheme, okay? And then so he explains it to her in the car, how it wasn't a gamble at all. He knew very well exactly what number this fellow was going to pick. So is foreknowledge the cause or effect of predestination? So the Bible says, makes both claims for God, that God does know in advance what's going to happen and that God determines in certain ways what's going to be what's going to happen. And there's a couple of logical necessities about that. So the notion of a God who doesn't know what's going to happen in advance would suggest that that God is something less than the term is meant to convey. So that might be a powerful being, but not God in this in a strict sense, because, because it's less than um, for, for the God of the Bible, this needs to be the best of all possible worlds. Otherwise, again, you have something less than God. And so you could argue that some God that doesn't know what's going to happen or some God that is responsible for a world that's not the best of all possible worlds is some actually some kind of villain. Thank you. Um, because responsible for all kinds of things happening when the God does not actually know what to do about it or how to fix it or make it better, any of those sorts of things, okay? So interesting also, if you had talked with the man who made the bet and picked the number, would he have insisted that he did that completely on his own? Yeah, right, nobody, he could just pick a number out there. And it's completely, and that's why it worked, because that man was absolutely convinced that nothing else was going on than him picking the number. And yet, in the background, when, when we show you, everything was going on that influenced him to pick that number. So that's part of the conversation about a free will, is that no one's will is exercised in a vacuum. Is that we're, we're surrounded by all kinds of sources and influences. And all of you, actually, that read the Lanier book, about social media, read about how the, 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 at least some people that work in social media are very particularly engineering to modify your behavior so you make the choices that they would like you to make. So we're gonna bump into that a little bit today in Romans. Um, if you don't have a place to be on Thanksgiving, um, you should let somebody know, uh, including me. Um, so most of the faculty here, uh, some of the staff, President uh, Thomas especially, tries to uh, make Thanksgiving still a great experience for people, even if they can't get home or something's, you know, you can't get where you want to be, especially. So um, if you don't have a place to be, and if you think spend, coming to dinner at my house on Thanksgiving sounds good, uh, you should let me know. Okay? Yeah, I promise I won't ask you hard questions or just be nice. 
the traditional things to eat. Okay, Romans 8, that's where we're at. Do you remember where to find it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Romans. And now chapter 8, and remember we're on a, we're on a track here, um, kind of from basic principles to building on the building blocks of um, all of the components that make up our life. So we've come through the, the, the human condition, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and, and I didn't have time to show you this, but Paul toggles back and forth in chapters 1, 2, and 3 between the kinds of corruption that you see evident in the Gentile population. And then he swings around because he knows that the Jewish population is going, yeah, see, we're not like that. He swings around and says, oh, you think you're better? And then he, then he exposes what's going on in the Jewish religious community. And so everybody ends up with this same condition. And then he moves on to, okay, what does God do about that condition? Which gets us to 8 verse 1. Uh, Parker, please, 8 verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in, in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And Jordan, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. But sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin you condemn sin in the flesh. Okay, so very much opposite of being aloof and distant from the human situation, God is beneath and, and bearing the weight of the human condition. And so the Son of God substitutes himself for all of humanity under the weight of the law in order to relieve us from the curse of the law. Okay, but the key thing is the language that's used. Remember, most people associate with Christianity and how it works, those two words that start with F. Faith and forgiveness, right? So it's all gotten collapsed into, and then faith becomes the new burden for you. If you have faith, then you have a good future. No faith, bad future. Then, you, then you're stuck with, well, do I have enough faith? Do I have the right faith? All these kinds of quagmire. It's like a swamp. Okay, so wanted to just think through a number of different categories having to do with how God provides for our life. Is it a matter of what you know? Well, to a certain extent it is, um, but you have to remember the, the biblical ideal of the child, especially the infant. So it's not so much information that you have enough of or the right kind of information or even the right disposition towards that information. That would be two and three, but it's information comes as this nature grows, information comes as an antidote. So we think more highly of ourselves than we should. So the truth comes to remind us that we're not independent, but dependent and interdependent, right? And that there is a design that promotes life and contradicting that design undermines life. Is it where you live? So you may have heard this for the first time. There is therefore, Parker, now no condemnation for whom? Those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ Jesus. So we're back to, yeah, well, here it is. Here we're back to this life of immersion in the water. Right now, the H2O in our in our universe is an indication of grace. Right? So, so Jesus Christ himself is described as living water, which is why as creator he makes this wet stuff which is why wet and water is so pervasive in our universe. Okay, you have water in your system. There's water all around us right now. It's all humidity, right? Okay. So, yeah, it, it, in that sentence, is it referring to people who actively worship Jesus, or is this like in everyone, everyone is a... Yeah, that's a great question. So what Parker's wondering about is when it says... There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that an exclusive expression or is it an inclusive expression? We're going to see a couple more, and I'm going to ask you to take out for a spin. It's inclusive. Okay, it's inclusive like this, like this reach of God's care for people and love for people is what if it's infinite, right? So is it possible for a person to experience life as if this weren't the case yes is it possible for you to worry 
and have anxiety and stresses about things that God says he'll take care of for you? Of course it is. So it doesn't mean, doesn't mean the providence isn't real. It just means that it's not, it's not functioning as intended in your system, right? Um, you could be uh, the heir, a child of the wealthiest person in the world, and you could die of starvation in a gutter, right? Why? Not because there wasn't support for you, but because you absented yourself from it for some reason. So there's reality, and then there's realization, and we'll talk about that a little more um, when we get to um, predestination. So it's more is coming on that. So where you live, if you live in a desert, um, water's going to be scarce. That's one kind of life. It's very different from a life where water is abundant. Um, back, if you ever study the nation of Egypt in history, they considered themselves the most favored people in the world because they had a constant source of water in the Nile. Only once in, in recorded history did the pharaoh leave Egypt to see what was going on somewhere else. And that pharaoh went up through um, Saudi Arabia, Sinai Peninsula, and came back and said, it is the weirdest place ever out there because you don't have water and you don't know when you're going to get some. And when you do, it falls out of the sky. Like, why would you live out there when you don't have it anytime you want? Okay, then a function of who generated you. So that's those two natures, the world and its corruptions coming from Adam or the word of God and spirit. Or is it a function of what you consume? So if you are what you eat and you eat perishables, then it's not a surprise that you ultimately perish too, as opposed to in another place, uh, we'll get this in John's gospel, Jesus describes himself as living bread. So if you eat something that is the source of life, then you and you will live. Um, two other particular verses in chapter eight. So a lot of people find Romans eight as one of their favorite chapters because it starts with verse one, but then includes uh, 8.8. Uh, no, you can read right there if you like. God makes, God makes all things work together to good to those who love them, or who are all according to the purpose. So just for a moment, remember, if we're in a one-dimensional world, if I only have a physical life and time, I would adamantly disagree with that. It's sort of like saying, when I save up and take my family to Disneyland, how do I expect everything to work that day? I mean, the rides should be working and the weather should be great and everything should be happy, right? That's, that's how this is supposed to work and I don't have many opportunities to do that. But in a broader sense, the essence of who we are, which we're in the process of discovering, is a very different kind of nature, has very different uh, design and expectations than this nature. So God is working to bring us back together as a whole person, according to design and verse 32, Kayla. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Okay, so that's the other passage. So by way of comparison, if we were fearful or worried or anxious about something that we, that we need God, want God to provide for us, he provides this comparison. Okay, so if you need housing, if God didn't spare his own son in order to restore your life to you, why would he do that and then not care if you have a place to be or your next meal or a future and a hope, that sort of thing. So that's a quick look at eight. Um, the phrase in, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I want to think about that little word in for a moment. Okay, so romantic sentimentality. Have any of you been in love? Is that a real place? <laughs> okay. is, if you were in love, then how did you get out of it? Did someone throw you out of it? Or did you, see if you fall in love, then you'd have to be anti-gravity to get back. So there's all kinds of romantic, sentimental notions that go on. But, but love in biblical sense of the word, care for people is a commitment. It's not something you fall into. It's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not something that comes and goes. It's permanent and constant. My life for yours, that's not going to change. So when you think about how do you know if you're in the pool or not, 
well, I guess you'd know, right? You're either in the pool or you're not. If you're sitting on the edge with half your leg in the water, you're sort of in the pool, but you could still be hot and get a sunburn. Okay, are you in the park? Are you in the hospital? And why would that be? And what would be happening there? Are you in trouble? That tends to be something we can't just jump our way out of. That's the opposite of what we're thinking about. Are you in the know, which is related to in the loop? So where's your consciousness? That would be true. So in as much as the promises of God are in your consciousness, then you have the, the value and the benefit of those promises that take away anxiety and fear that promote and inspire care of other people, which God's idea about what the right place is. Okay, Romans 10, can you go ahead? We're skipping over nine. I'll show you why in just a minute. Uh, 10 verse 1 now. Andrea, please. Okay, um, he's talking about his um, uh, Jewish people. Okay, verse 2. For I bear them witness that they have received their God, but not according to me. And so they not know the righteousness of God and suffer silence for us. They did not submit to God. Mm -hmm. I seek the culmination of the law so that they may be righteousness for everyone who needs to be. Yeah, that's an unfortunately complicated way of translating the verse. So Christ is the end of the law. Oh, no. Okay. So Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes, believe, faith, trust, remember, comes back into, just comes to rest in the truth of what the situation is, as God provides it. So because Jesus fulfills the law, the law can't condemn us anymore. We, we also become people who fulfilled the law because Christ gives his work to us as, as our own. This is a lot of work. This is what Paul himself was doing when he was a Pharisee. Um, this is what he thought he was doing when he was on the road to Damascus to arrest Christians. This is a person trying to establish their own righteousness. So think about what a, what a labor that is to always have to be right. Think the right thing, say the right thing, do the right thing 24-7. And, and if you haven't and somebody accuses you of failing, then it gets even harder because you're going to have to argue your way back out of it. And if you're wrong, that may be impossible to do. So all of this burden you know, goes away, come back over here. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That's not how this kingdom operates. Operates by love, not by obligation. Uh, verse 5, Grace. Mm -hmm. Six. Julie. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So notice honesty about dependent doesn't think about or talk about what it's going to do, rather, uh, Indy. For what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we believe. Mm -hmm. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will save. Here. Or with God raised him from the dead. From... For with the heart yeah. one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Okay, now we need to be careful with that last spot there because it sounds like first Paul says, Faith doesn't talk about what I do, it comes to rest in what God does for me. And then he goes right on to say, Well, and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. Okay, so are we right back to it's what I do now, not what God does for me? And then we get another bad translation. So if you look in your uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 10, does your translation say, for with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth one confesses or makes confession to salvation? Like it's the person doing it? Mm -hmm. See, that's unfortunate. That's not... That's not what it says. It says, because this is how it works, because with the heart, it is believed to righteousness. What's believed? 
this word. Notice that it's, it's near you, it's in your mouth, and in your heart. So it's the word that's doing the work. So the, this mouth and this heart can't be saved. That's why it has to eventually uh, return to the dust. It's this very word that regenerates a soul. It gives you a new mind, a new heart. It gives you a mouth to confess what's, what the honest truth is. So it's the word that's doing the work, and you're the person that's doing the work in, which is an indication of your situation now. Oh, say, I, I have confidence in God who provides my life for me. How else could I have that if he wasn't working it in me? So tease out a little bit of these components that work in honesty about dependence. Now, this has to do with antidote for the red human condition for our corruption, right? Um, that brings us back into honesty. So knowledge. So when you, if you're thinking that your life is a product of your own making, it's important to know that that's not actually true, that your life comes from outside of you. Assent means you, you don't just know that, but you come to terms with it. Like, I accept that. That's true. I'm not the source of my own life. It would be important for me to remember that, right? So as often as I remember that my life is dependent and interdependent, then I would be careful with the people and the things around me, correct? Because I know my life depends on you and yours on mine. But I often forget that, which tends to make me selfish, which tends to make me compete with you instead of cooperate with you. Articulation is mentioned by Paul. With the mouth, this is spoken. And that has to do with the value of um, coming to understand something more uh, more fully, I guess, right? Have you had teachers before or professors in the university who obviously are familiar with their subject enough to teach it, but, but they, don't, they don't know it well enough to find a way to communicate it to every student, right? Uh, math, I think that goes on a lot with math. I think there are people out there that get math, but, but don't know how to, Help someone else. So my son had learning disabilities and he was failing all of his math in junior high school. So we took him out of that school and put him in a different school who had a teacher dedicated to this. Just like night and day. My son's like, I get it, right? Because the teacher said, okay, this is how you, how you can come to understand what we're trying to do in algebra kind of a thing. So articulation, um, same thing with um, Engineering, right? Engineering is a very articulate field. So surgery and medicine um, and, and, and precision is all important for, for success. And then, of course, your, your life needs to function according to what it is you have come to know is true. Like, if my life does depend on everyone else, then I need to function accordingly, right? Being careful with them and they with me. And then because this is a spiritual thing, it takes a power supply, right? So it's not just coming into existence as a regenerate soul, but there needs to be a constant support for that life, which is when the Holy Spirit comes in. So food and water in our physical experience is analogous to living bread, living water, um, the revelation of God to us that reminds us of truth and that reminds us that our life is supported by God. Like what? like the sun shining, like being able to go to sleep, like having food available to us to eat and water and family and friends and joy and opportunities and those kinds of things. And of course, the Bible. All right, so if you look in chapter nine, um, actually, let me, actually go back to 829 for just a second, because he, Chapter nine is introduced already in chapter eight. So um, we're at, oh, Parker, sorry. Yeah, um, it seems like the issue of transla like the translational issues that you keep pointing out, that mm -hmm. seems like a huge systemic institutional problem that is not being addressed whatsoever because the key, um, what you're saying and then what is written here have two largely different yeah. Why is that not something that is being changed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's a couple of different parts to the answer. 
one question or one part of the answer is uh, money. So publishers are in business to make money, which means they need to sell what they print, which means what they print needs to find acceptance in the public, which means it's going to, in as much as it thinks it can do so responsibly, let me just put it like that. In other words, I don't think that the translators of these various English translations sit down with some kind of devious, right, idea in mind, and they're going to change the language to, to reverse what the Bible is trying to say. Nevertheless, if you, if you have a pre-commitment to a publisher who wants the Bible to appeal to the public that reads it, then it is going to affect the way you translate it. Part of it is a practical in, interest. So there are lots of places in Hebrew and in Greek where a single word really to convey what it's meaning would take up to 11 English words. And they're not gonna do that. They're just gonna make the thing just too many pages. So, so there's all those sort of pressures on, on printing. Part of it, I think also is um, a commitment to the idea that human beings are uh, independent, that we have a free will, that we have the capacity to do to um, accomplish what life requires of us. And so the Bible should be a book that encourages you in that thinking. And sort of, it's sort of like, you can do it if you try hard enough, and we're gonna tell you how to try hard enough. It's gonna look like this, like if you do X, Y, and Z, right? And so Christianity itself is going to depend on people who Kind of like kind of like responsible medical care it's going to just it's going to depend on people who care more about conveying what that text actually conveyed than profits or popularity um the other thing the other thing that's at work too i didn't want to forget to say this is that particular language and grammar in translation can still be corrected by larger narratives so for example uh, but does the Bible say that God has saved you and this is what it looks like? Or does it say you could be saved if you met certain conditions? Well, let's go back and read narratives. How did the children of Israel come out of bondage in Egypt? Well, they didn't get themselves out of bondage. So God sent people. God was active. God brought Israel out of Egypt by his own activity. Okay, so you can't goof that up in terms of translation. So it does have sort of by depth or by breadth a corrective dynamic to it, which is good. Yeah, it is aggravating to me though, because I have to fix this all the time. And some English translations are better than others. So there's probably 30 or more English translations of the Bible. So New King James Version is, is trying to be literal, but it does have this influence of the human ego in it. Right? So, for example, lots of psalms have the phrase, seek refuge. So I sought refuge in God. That consistently gets translated as, I put my trust in God, which bears no resemblance whatsoever. But it is more appealing to the human ego. To, to, because to say I sought refuge means that I'm, I'm weak, correct? I'm the needy, weak person. Uh, my ego doesn't like that to put my trust in, I like the sound of that because that means I'm in control. I made a choice or a decision. That sounds like something I could um, identify with. Yeah, yes. Okay, good. Um, so eight verse 29, um, Catalina, are you there? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Yeah. To the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn in the name. And Sonny, are you there? Oh, verse uh, 30 now, 8 verse 30. 8 verse 30. Mm -hmm. 10. Yeah, it happens to me too. Um, and those who he was. Um, mm -hmm. Predestined? predestined? Yeah, predestined. Yes. Uh, he also called, and those who he called, he also justified, and those who he justified, he also called. And one more, Christian 31. Uh, 
What then shall we say? Um, let me, <laughs> what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And that is a universal reach. If God is for us, who can be against us? Of course, there's an answer to that question, like the devil and the corruption in my own human nature and in my neighbors. Okay, so what we're running into in chapters 9 and 11 is this teaching of predestination in the Bible, also known as divine election. In other words, God elects, God does the choosing of those who would be saved. Okay, so the essence of that teaching is like this. So God determines before creation that you would live forever that you would live X number of days. The Bible does say that your days in this world have been defined by God, not just in the, in the chronology of it, but also in the content of it, that you would do certain things in the course of your life in this time and world as a part of the big tapestry or the, the big puzzle of how God makes this the best of all possible worlds, that you would live under, in, and upon Right? So in, in every direction, you would live by his gracious providence. So that ends up results in all things are yours in heaven and on earth. And the Bible makes that statement and you can't die. So what's the problem? Okay, so the problem is remembering all the forces at work all around you, also ordered by God's love, wisdom and power. Um, but, but they're not always friendly forces. <laughs> So often it feels like God and everyone else is against me, but it tends to be, or maybe even it's exclusively, uh, I get that sense of things from my ego, not from my soul, and remembering that we're in the middle of something. So being in the middle of something often comes with, with uncertainty, it might come with confusion, uh, it might come with pain, but, there, but then good things result if we, if we stay the course. Okay. So, so predestination. Um, some people expect this to answer the question, why are some people saved ultimately and not others? Okay. To understand what the Bible is trying to convey in, in terms of predestination, you have, to, you have to put three biblical teachings next to each other. So first one. God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible says that uh, in many, many different places, and it also says it in narrative. God brought all the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he even brought Egyptians and other foreigners out of Egyptian bondage. Okay? Uh, who did Jesus die for? How many? Everybody. Okay, it also teaches that we are condemned by our own determination. It is this corruption in me, but it's in me, and I'm the one that's fighting against God's design for my life. I fight against God. I fight against my neighbor. I fight against my enemy. I fight against my friends. Okay, that's my determination, and we are saved by God's own determination by way of contrast, and both of those things are taught in a multitude of places, too. Now, it seems... Um, to, to lots of people, that all three of those things can't be true at the same time. Well, maybe, maybe not, okay? Um, if you show me this little cube, I'm going to say there's no solution to it. But you'd say there has to be a solution, correct? How do you know there has to be a solution to this? I've seen people do it, maybe, or when, when you got it from the store, it came all lined up, yes? So it started there, so there must be a way to get back there, okay? And part of the solution to that problem is that it's three-dimensional, so there must be a way to do it. Uh, and maybe the best part of the Apollo 13 movie is that they weren't going to give up on the astronauts out there, right? They said, okay, here's what's available. Do we have what we need to get this thing working enough to get the astronauts back to Earth? So there has to be a way. That's the idea. There has to be a way, even if we can't see it at the moment. But in history, people have tried to logically reconcile these teachings. Okay, So there is uh, the reform movement, um, Baptists and um, 
uh, Armenians, and basically most of Christianity um, assumes this, that if, if, if our condemnation, if our guilt is a function of our choices, then our salvation should also be a function of our choices, very much a function of the assumption of a free will. I have a free will, I can choose one or the other. And theologians like that idea because it gets God off the hook. So God's not responsible for anybody dying because you had the choice and you made the wrong one. So how's that God's fault? Does that absolve God of the problem? In other words, if God made me in such a way that I have a free will, and he knew that I was going to make the wrong choice with my will, and in so doing, lose my life, isn't that still a function of God's doing? In other words, if God wanted me to be different, why didn't he, why didn't he make me different? Okay, and, and so this is not what the Bible's teaching. Um, over here is something that's peculiar to John Calvin. You heard John Calvin, Presbyterian Church? Okay, so John Calvin actually taught a thing called double predestination. So John Calvin said, well, rationally speaking, if God determines who's going to be saved, then God also determines who's going to be condemned. So then someone would ask, well, John Calvin, what do you do with this passage? God desires all to be saved. John Calvin said, well, all, all means only the people who are predestined to be saved. So Jesus didn't actually die for the sins of the world. He only died for the sins of people that God had predestined out of the world. So now you have a new translation problem. If the word all means some, how would you say all? If you meant to say everybody, how would you say it if somebody's changed the word all into some? Okay. And of course, there's narratives that that contradict what John Calvin was advocating there, okay? So, as with creation, you see the purple ink up there, as with creation and salvation, the burden in this teaching is on the one opposing it. In other words, the biblical teaching of predestination says you're part of it, that God predestined you from before creation to, to be, to have a life that he provides for you including the recovery of that life in spite of this corruption that's at work in your nature. It never excludes anybody. And, and the Bible very consistently does that with this teaching. In other words, which people did God create? All the people. And he's still creating all the people all the time. Which people does God love? All the people. Which, which people did God intend to... Um, uh, inspire and, and regenerate by the teaching of his truth and grace. All the people. Who did he predestine? Everybody. So the burden here to oppose this kind of teaching is to argue your way out of what God has already um, supporting you with. Questions? So what I mean for all of you is you should leave the classroom today knowing that God has predestined you to live forever. He has predestined you to be the subject of his love and his activity in your life and for you to experience that more and more over the course of time and then into forever. That's a good way to go in the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, too, we get in trouble when we're, when we're trying to get answers from the Bible that the Bible's not interested in answering. So there's a back and forth here. Is the Bible interested in answering the question, how I'm saved? Absolutely, and it answers it from Genesis through Revelation. The answer is that God does save you, and he gives you lots of different ways of understanding that, from, from conception and being birthed, to the life support of simple things like water and bread, to family and community and loved ones and healing and all sorts of things like that. There is something in the human intellect that bothers people. Like, why does God save some and not others? But is that a question that God wants us to entertain? In other words, why would you ever assume that God hadn't saved someone? And if you assume that God hasn't saved one or doesn't love someone, then you're coming to a conclusion too early in the course of a person's life, right? So remember Matthew 7, 
judge not, don't judge anyone else, right? Because that's going to come back to judge you. So we're going to leave that. We're going to assume we're just going to function on the side of that God has saved everyone. And that's what we're going to focus on, concentrate on. How do I know I'm saved? He gives us a multitude of ways of knowing that, both in terms of the comprehensive work of Jesus in history, but also personally. So those are sacraments. So um, baptism is God's confirmation of his love and promises in your life. Um, the meal at his table weekly or maybe even daily reassures you that God's love and grace is at work in your life and it is for you. And also absolution. To, so to have someone tell you that your sins are not condemning you because they have been taken away uh, by the life of Jesus. If you're saved once, are you always saved? The Bible doesn't answer that question because of the kind of question it is. It's that sort of question uh, that does come up sometimes where a person will say, can I do X and still go to heaven when I die? Can I, can I murder a person and still go to heaven when I die? What's the answer? Well, David, King David was a murderer, was he not? Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and by biblical accounts, he did go to heaven when he dies. But what's the real question? Not can I go to heaven if I die if I murder someone? What's the real question? Why would I want to murder someone? It's so completely upside down and backwards from the model we're working with. Yes, I would endure anything for the sake of my neighbor's life and well-being. I certainly wouldn't premeditate to take it away. <laughs> Okay, so now last question, what do I do with myself in the light of these realities? So if all things are yours in heaven and on earth, and you can't die, and God makes all things work together for good, what's left? Well, that would be to, to pass that on, to extend that, so your, your life becomes an extension of God's life in the world for the sake of others. What about the... Um, it used to be the person in Africa, but Africa has had a lot of long, long centuries of mission work going on in it, but what about the person who never heard the gospel, who never heard the truth? And that question is based on the premise that, that you need information in order to be saved. It's, it's, it's collapsed into this model, and that's why it has a struggle. In a three-dimensional worldview model, where nature itself is God's revelation, where God has saved you, and that's and that's the um, controlling reality, unless you succeed in contradicting it, that, that's not a question that we need to entertain. Or the answer to that question would be, God has saved that person too. Okay, so that's a kind of a quick look at um, predestination questions. Okay, so the main thing is to remember that it's always a positive teaching in the Bible. God has and continues to choose everyone to be restored to life as he intended us to know it. On to 12, chapter 12, now verse 1. And we're at, oh, me. where are we? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay, Bill. Yeah. He, he wants you to do this thing. I use your body as a as a sacrifice on behalf of other people. Does he command you to do it, or does he use some other kind of language before he gets to that? He says he appeals to them, so like I hope you do. Uh, a little better than hope, but you're right. There is hope. I appeal to you by the what does he say? Uh, by the mercies of God. Mercies, not by threat. Not by obligation, not by necessity, I appeal to you by the mercies of Christ. In other words, because the mercies of the Son of God support your life, what's the reasonable thing to do? Here's another translation moment. Um, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, what's, what's the, what's it say, Parker, the last, which is your what? Last few words. Um, Spiritual act of worship. Spiritual act of worship. Anybody have something different? Spiritual act of worship. Amen. 
to a proper what? Say that's what it is. Okay. Um, it's not hard, which is your reasonable. That's the Greek word for like reason as in rational service. And that word liturgy, some people may know that word from the life in the church. It means an order of service, but the word came from civil service. So that's the word you would use for a person who is a civil servant, everyone's servant in the community. Okay, so I appeal to you by the mercies of Christ that you use your body as a living sacrifice for the sake of others, which is your rational service. It makes sense on a number of levels, right? Level number one is that your physical nature is perishing, is it not? It's it's going to get spent anyway. So now the opportunity is to spend your, your life in time and space, your phys physiology. Do you want to make it mean something that will endure for the lives of others? Or do you want to take from the lives of others to, to consume it in a life that won't, that won't endure? That's why it's rational. Okay, it's also rational because serving others tends to actually tends to give your life meaning and significance right so for example it's not uncommon for people who can't see any value in their labor to have trouble going to work or staying with a job like that right i just can't it's not inspiring to me it's very different from people who have very um, very concretely um Jobs that concretely are a service to someone else, whether it's cleaning or whether it's food service or whether it's healthcare, whether it's teaching, it can be a whole multitude of things. But if you see your time in your physical life as a service to other people's lives, that's an inspiration. And it's rational to do that. Uh, verse two, um, Jasmine, please. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Thank you. So don't be what, Jasmine? Transformed. But be rather what? Transformed. Okay. So there's, there's the Bible talking to your two natures. So one of the problems with people's perception of Christianity, and this was mine too, is that what I see in public Christianity looks totally conformed to the world. Yes? So, so the world builds buildings, and so do churches. And the world has corporate head, headquarters that are impressive, big buildings and expensive. So do churches. They build headquarters too. Um, I, don't, I don't know very many Christians who aren't pursuing what's going on in the world just like anyone else in their community. So, and, and it's not uncommon for Christians to pray to God for what? What kind of success? success? Material success, right? I I know people who, who pray for God to help them win the lottery, right? Uh, <laughs> um, even and 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 this got to be a little careful with this because I I do this too. But we even tend to to be pretty consumed or occupied with fear about and so prayers for the safety, and sometimes more even than safety, the efficiency of our life in this world. So if we're going on a trip or on a vacation, it's not uncommon for a Christian to pray for God to make this all go how? Just nice, right? No delays in air flights, no, nobody gets sick, everything, nobody loses anything. So we tend to pray for convenience inside this world, as opposed to praying for insights or a disposition perception that helps us see value or good in all of the circumstances that we that we make our, our way through. And last in verse three, um, let me have you, yeah, please. Uh, okay. Yeah, so if we were going to talk about faith as a, uh, as a quantity, and this is the only place I know of where it sounds like faith is a quantity, although I'm, I'm still, I still um, suggest that it's honesty, like it's how honest you're willing to be about things. Even that 
is a function of God's determination. So if we think about faith as a, you know, in a more broad category, do people have different sets of talents and abilities, strengths and weaknesses? Of course we all do. Would it be a surprise if that was true also in terms of the Christian mission? Okay, so for example, I have friends that um, do prison ministry, go into prisons and visit prisoners and befriend them, establish rapport and try to help them make their way through that course of their life. I'm not going into any prison ever. I'd be totally into it. It might have something to do with claustrophobia, maybe. But on the other hand, uh, I've been called lots of different times in different hours of the night by the state police to come to somebody's house because there's a domestic problem. Any law enforcement people that know about domestic problems, uh, they do not like to go to those calls. Why? Because it's so volatile. You never know what's going to happen when. And so <laughs> typically when I get to the house and I'm there with the screaming, unhappy, angry people, like the, the state police are gone. I just looked at them and they left. So here I am. It didn't occur to me that this might become that deadly for me. It just didn't. Not by choice. That's just how God built me. So you all have certain fears of certain things or disinterest in things. You may be extrovert or introvert. But all of us are constructed in a way that God has ordained or provided for you to do something just right in the, in the world around you. Okay, so there's a little more in Romans, but you can get it in the notes. Um, hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you Monday. And we'll start from whatever's next. Uh, captivity letters, I think. That and, uh, See you back.